Join the conversation with Cape Talk. It's 23 minutes now to 10 o'clock and it's time to say hello to Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist. Hello, Chris. Africa, hi. Good to talk to you. Lovely to chat to you. Now, try and make me understand, please, what the gravitational wave detectors, one is, and when they turned back on last month and are already returning some discoveries, what does all this mean? Right. Well, a Nobel Prize was won just just recently, in the last couple of years, for the discovery of this phenomenon called gravitational waves. Kip Thorne was one of the winners. Now, why this matters is that we have, for hundreds of years, been observing the universe uh, that you know around us using electromagnetic waves, light, whether that's radio waves or light we can see or X-rays or gamma rays. But the problem is that that can only tell us so much. And one of the predictions of Einstein's work was that you should see ripples of gravitational waves across the fabric of space. This is called space-time. And because this will not be affected by intervening matter in the same way that electromagnetic waves are, it can enable us to have a new regime or see a new vista of space or interrogate the universe in a new way. And so researchers set out to detect these gravitational waves, which they successfully did. The initial observations were the merger of two black holes, and that's what won a Nobel Prize and also added further weight to Einstein's theory of general relativity. But having made those initial detections, the group of scientists who are behind the detectors, and there are three of them on Earth now, there's one in Italy, it's called Virgo, and there are two in the US, they're called LIGO, they took some time off, they took 19 months of downtime while they recalibrated the instruments and added various tweaks and changes that would make them much more sensitive. And at the beginning of April, 1st of April, April Fool's Day, it was no fool for them because they turned these devices back on after 19 months of updating and immediately began to see signals. And in just the last couple of days, they're beginning to announce the discoveries that they've made in just one month. And the scale of the discoveries has escalated and the rate of them too, because the devices are so good. And one of the reports out this week is that they've now seen for the first time what looks like a black hole eating a neutron star. And so when these two gravitationally massive objects interact with each other, they stretch and bend space. And this sends these sequences of gravitational waves to the Earth. We can pick them up and then we can decode based on the pattern that's arriving at the three detectors what must be causing that pattern of waves. So this this is adding further validation to the theory of general relativity and gravitational waves, but but it is beginning to reveal new insights into how the universe works. So it is really, really exciting. It sounds like it. Um, is the black hole any closer or are we any closer to it? I'm, I just don't, don't want to be swallowed up, Chris. You don't worry, Africa. This is OK. Um, this is 1.2 billion light years away where we think that this neutron star was swallowed by a black hole. But no, I mean, the, the added sort of movement in this or the, the added information we now have is that because they have roboticized the whole process, in other words, as soon as the detection comes in, they also have devices now which enable them to swing ground-based telescopes onto the source of where we think these waves are coming from because with three different detection sites across the Earth's surface, you can resolve where the waves are most likely to be coming from in many cases. And by using this robotic array, you can get telescopes which are very fast at swinging onto target, including one in California, in, in San Diego. And these enable you not just to see the gravitational waves arrive with those detectors, but then also see if there's any other corresponding light rays or gamma rays or X-rays, you know, other things that we can detect now. We can begin to look for those um, gamma rays possibly in future. But certainly we can begin to see if we can see a physical object out there which is corresponding to what's causing the gravitational waves we see. So you know you're not going to get swallowed by a black hole soon, it's a long way away, but actually it's bringing those distant objects a lot closer to Earth because we're able to see them in a way we never could before. And I suppose part of the excitement is the speed at which we're able to see these images and signals, right? Well, also the information carries fast because if you think about it, once someone catches onto a story in this digital age, it goes around the world incredibly quickly. So certainly once a picture is is created, then uh, it's distributed very fast. But remember, when, when these signals arrive, they're very subtle. They're largely mathematical 
anomalies that, that are being picked up here, which are then processed and carefully interrogated by computer, sequ- by computer software and then clever people who will work out that they're seeing something for real. But, but that process is getting faster all the time. And so, yes, now, now they can detect pretty quickly that there's gravitational waves arriving and they begin to look for the source of them and look in the, in the ver- visual range as well. So this, this is an exciting time. Stay tuned. It truly is. <laughs> it truly, truly is. Uh, the Naked Scientist is here to answer all of your science-related questions. You can call me on 21 I already have a few WhatsApp messages with questions for Chris, but I always prefer it when you call and ask Chris your questions yourself. 21 Chris, a nice and easy one to start off with. Why can only some animals be domesticated? This is almost certainly an an aspect of genetics because what makes an animal the animal that it is is the DNA that it inherits from its parents. And that DNA, a combination or clutch of genes, is honed, refined and adapted by the environment in which that animal lives. And that environment includes things like predation pressure and other pressures that mean the animal evolves or changes or learns to behave a certain way. And some of those genes make a certain set of animals much more frightened or much more skittish, so they're less likely to want to interact with people. Um, Some of those genes make an animal more amenable to wanting to learn new things or be curious. And in order to want to interact with us, for example, they have to be curious and they have to be intelligent. So this all comes down to genes. So some animals can be trained. Some animals are much friendlier. Some animals just can't. There was a very interesting experiment done in Russia a number of years ago where they took foxes and they bred these foxes and then looked at the traits of the foxes. And some of them were quite vicious and some of them were quite friendly. So they started segregating them on the basis of trait and breeding them for those traits and found that they could quite quickly get down to individuals that always had babies that were very friendly and always had babies that were very unfriendly. So this shows you that it's the genetic makeup of an individual that that loads the dice, if you will, so that when that individual interacts with its environment, it's more likely to behave in a certain way. So when you see an animal out there that's a very friendly dog, it's because humans have been rearing and, and selecting and breeding those dogs for thousands of years to have those characteristics. And it's the same in the wild. The wild is breeding animals to survive and If they're very friendly and overly trusting, they're going to become someone's lunch quite quickly, especially in in the African savannah. So as a result, there's quite a strong incentive for many wild animals not to be too trusting. Indeed. And of course, the jury is out on whether or not cats are domesticated animals. I think cats just tolerate us as human beings and come to us when it's convenient for them. Yeah, Dogs have owners and cats have slaves, don't they, they say. Exactly. Relating to cats, Jill in Greenpoint, you're the first person with a question for Chris today. What's your question for Chris? Good morning. Hello, Africa. I'm Chris. Good morning. The purring in cats, is it voluntary or involuntary? Ah, now that's an interesting one. What we know about purring is that it's not just an on or off phenomenon and it's not just a single thing. Uh, A lady who works in the UK, actually a number of years ago, did some interesting experiments. She's a scientist and she also happens to keep cats. And she noticed that in the morning her cat would keep waking her up because it wanted to be let into her bedroom. It would pester her and and then get fed. And she thought, because she was listening carefully, that it sounded different when it purred and made noises in the morning when it wanted to be fed compared to when it was just purring because she was rubbing its back or its ears or whatever. So she actually made some recordings. And what she found is that when cats want something, they produce a purr which is slightly different. It's what she dubbed a solicitation purr. And when she looked at the acoustic, the sound profile of the noises from the purr, she found that there's the normal purring noise and then added into it were some extra sounds at several hundred hertz. And that is the same frequency, she found, interestingly, that babies cry at. Babies choose those range of frequencies because it's something that we're very sensitive to because everyone reacts to a crying baby. You have this instinct to go and look after it. Cats have have evolved to exploit our tendency to respond to that frequency so they get what they want too. So I think to answer your question, purring in cats is a voluntary thing and it's something actually they use and exploit us with and they can also adapt to meet the situation. So when they want something, they add in these extra sound frequencies that are guaranteed to get your attention and then 
you're more likely to realise the cat wants feeding. It needs to be fed. Go and feed the cat. Jill, thank you very much for that very interesting question. John in Berkfleet. Hello, John. What's your question for Chris? Good morning. Good morning, Africa. Good morning, Chris. Uh, about seven years ago, I had a triple uh, coronary artery bypass operation. And a few days after the operation, I noticed that my sense of smell was greatly heightened. Food tasted different. And at one stage, I even found the smell of the bar of soap in the bathroom 10 meters away was quite offensively strong. <laughs> Uh, and it was it bothered me a bit, but it also interested me quite a bit. And over the next few weeks, uh, it gradually faded away. And after about a month, I was completely back to normal. And I've never found out what would cause my sense of smell to become so enhanced for that few weeks. Have you any idea? Interesting question, John. Chris? Hello, John. I'm, I'm glad to hear that the, the uh, operation was a success in other respects as well. I've not heard of this phenomenon, but there are a number of possibilities. One is that you have an, a degree of chronic rhinitis. Maybe you have allergies or something, I don't know. And maybe that's clogging up your air passages a bit. When you went under the operational on the surgical table, they would have done a number of things. One of them is give you a whole bunch of antibiotics and also keep you in, a, in an environment where you're much less likely to catch anything or be exposed to dirty air and allergens and pollution for a while. So perhaps that led to a, a resolution temporarily of, of what might be a low grade you might not realise you've got it, but rhinitis, inflammation in the nose, perhaps because of allergy, and perhaps that was a, a, a preventing the smells in the air getting to the olfactory epithelium at the top of your nose where fine sprays of nerve endings pick up the chemicals in the air and relay them to the brain. The fact that you were able to smell things really well transiently and then it went away again argues that it's probably that you haven't changed your sense of smell at all. It's probably something to do with how the system is is working and having access to those smells. I've not come across anyone having a surgery and then saying their sense of smell is profoundly enhanced. But if that is a phenomenon that people have come across, do please tell me because I'd, I'd love to hear. And I'll do a little bit more poking around. But I, I my money would be, John, on it being something to do with clearer airways subsequently and the fact that you've you've gone back to normal what you dub normal downstream of this argues that that's more likely but you know if anyone knows better do let me know please 021 446 john thank you very much for your question keeping it matters nasal christy is in hard bay christy what's your question for chris hi good morning chris um i'm actually christmas so hi christmas um <laughs> I would just like to know, it's a bit of a silly question, but when you have a cold, when you go to sleep at night, your your nose stops running. But as you wake up in the morning, as you come conscious, you can feel your nose start to run again. And I wonder why when we're asleep, our bodies are able to stop our noses running, but when we're awake, they can't. That's an interesting question. Thanks, Christy. Hi, Chris Smith. Well, the answer to this is that when we go to sleep, all of your secretions dry up a bit. And that doesn't just mean your nose, your saliva flow dries up a bit. When you wake up in the morning and think, ah, my mouth is dry as anything and it feels awful, it's because your saliva flow has been reduced. Your eyes also develop sleep and get crusty because your tear flow is reduced. It's a, a mechanism to conserve resources. So when we go to sleep, we don't need to be producing tons and tons of saliva because we breathe more slowly. We're talking a little bit in our sleep, but much less and we're moving around so we're not moving dry air in and out so much and we haven't got our eyes open to evaporate fluid from the surfaces of our eyes so you don't need to pump the same volume of tears across your eyes. This is achieved by a nerve reflex so when you go to sleep the same systems that actually are involved in shutting your body down, changing how the information flows from the, the parts of your brain that make you move so that you can't act out your dreams, those same processes also switch in the system that then suppresses tear production, suppresses saliva production and also changes the production of mucus in your nose. So the way mucus is made in the nose is that you have blood vessels which open up, bring in blood and you filter liquid from the blood to make some of the secretions. Also you feed gland tissue in the nose and those gland tissues make mucus and those two secretions that are then what we dub snot. And if you reduce the blood flow to the nose and reduce the nerve drive to those glands to make less mucus, which is the same process as making less saliva and less tears, you're going to make less mucus, which is why when you go to sleep at night, your nose doesn't run quite as much. It still stays pretty bunged up and horrible, as we all know, but it's usually a bit less when you go to sleep, and that's the reason.
Good question, Christy. Thank you very much for asking it. Alex is in Frederick. Alex, good morning. What's your question for Chris? Uh, good morning to you. Uh, morning, Chris. Um, I'd like to talk to you about moon dust on our moon. Our moon is supposed to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years old. The lunar surface is, is exposed to direct sunlight and strong ultraviolet light and X-rays that can destroy the surface of layers of rock exposed, reducing them at a rate of 10,000 uh, 10, thousandths of an inch per year. But even this minute amount during the age of the moon could be sufficient to fall, form a layer seven, several miles deep. Now, when Neil Armstrong went to the moon on Apollo 12, he was actually concerned that he would sink into the moon uh, because of the depth of the dust. But in fact, it was found only to be a few inches deep. Now, if the moon is that old, how come that dust is so uh, uh, small? Good question. Hello, Chris. Alex. Uh, just to add a little bit more detail to this. So the moon, we think, is about 4.57 billion years old. And uh, in other words, it's about the same age as the Earth. So the very young Earth, which formed about then, hit another planet in the, when the solar system was much younger. And that collision led to the ejection of a lot of the crust material of our planet, plus the planet that came in. And that crust material was ejected into a, initially an enormous shroud around the Earth, which then slowly coalesced into what would have been a ring a bit like Saturn, and that was slowly then scooped up by what became the Moon. And this is why we have a Moon which, compared to the size of our planet, is relatively large. The Moon's about a, about a fifth of the size of the Earth. So as Moons go, that's pretty big. So it's been... Um, impacted by cosmic rays, as you rightly say, for about four and a half billion years. That's a long time. And as you point out, when you have these photons of high energy light and other cosmic ray particles hitting the surface, then it can actually move them around, jockey them against each other. So they rub up against each other and rub down and wear apart and they make dust particles. But I think one has to remember that those dust particles also absorb some of that energy and they reflect a lot of it. So once you've built up a threshold layer, then actually any more energy incoming is going to be dissipated within that surface layer. So I think there's probably a threshold maximum thickness without something to come and perturb it and rub it away to expose bare rock again, before, beyond which you're not going to make up any more dust. So that would be my speculation as to why you don't turn an entire body like the moon into just a huge pile of dust, because there's a limit to how penetrating the radiation is and therefore how much of that effect can happen. Interesting. Alex, thank you for your call. Mike is in Fishhook. Good morning, Mike. Your question for Chris. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Yes, I have a question for Chris, please. Um, we're told that uh, our bodies uh, are constantly undergoing cell replacement and that eventually none of the cells we had a few years back uh, are, remain. My question is, how is it that uh, childhood scars, you know, little scars from rugby tackles and so on, how do these still uh, show up in old age? Good morning, Mike. Chris? And um, this is actually a question we had about, was about 10 years ago when we first started doing this show. Someone phoned in and said, can I carbon date my grandma? Because she's not quite sure how old she is. We think she's almost 100. And we're wondering if we could carbon date her to work out how old she really is. We went to a lady at the Karolinska Institute, as she was then, as she may still be there, called Kirsty Spaulding, who had published a paper in a fairly major journal where she had actually been doing this sort of work to work out how old some cells are in the body. And the rationale for doing this is that the DNA in your cells, when, when you have a cell which is born at the same time that you're conceived, the DNA in there is not going to change. So the atoms that make up that DNA will be the same throughout your life in that cell. So if you can look at the amount of radioactive carbon, the carbon-14 in that DNA, which must have been put there when that cell was first formed, this gives you some idea as to how old that particular cell is and therefore how old that individual is and you can do this for different cell types in different tissues to work out how fast different tissues turn over or what the cell replacement rate is she found for instance that fat cells in the body have a lifetime of about 12 years if you did it for a nerve cell you'd find that a nerve cell is the same age you are because nerve cells are post mitotic in other words they're not growing they're not dividing they're formed in your development early on at the beginning of your life and you then make them last a lifetime. They're really long-lived cells. Skin cells, on the other hand, where well, you're shedding about 30 or 40,000 of those every second or so. They're very fast turnover. 
Now, the reason you have scars which persist a lot, uh, across a lifetime is that although the body's really good at repairing itself and it uses stem cells to make new cells to replace those that die off, those that we lose or those that are damaged by other injuries and so on, they follow a pattern of development and they're laid down according to a scaffolding in the tissue around them. If you come in and injure a piece of tissue and you damage that scaffolding, then the body will say, well, I really need to heal this wound because I'm going to die of an infection or blood loss or fluid loss if I don't. And actually, I don't really care if I don't make a perfect wound repair as long as I close the wound. So the body stuffs as many cells and as much fibrous tissue in there as it can in the process, it disrupts the scaffolding. And after that, the guide as to where to put the cells beautifully is disturbed and lost, but the wound is closed. But because of that disturbance to the scaffolding, the next set of cells that come through end up in slightly the wrong place. So you end up with this persistent scar in some tissues. Mike, a very interesting question indeed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we did receive, Chris, a message from someone ref- um, following our call from John who had a heart operation and then started smelling things more intensely, if you like, for a period of time. The message reads, regarding the nasal enhancement after a big operation, the same happened to me. I've always had a good nose, but the enhancement after the operation was amazing and it made me smile while it lasted. So if you will, do you mind doing a wonderful exercise Exercise. This is your homework, Chris. <laughs> and then come back to us in a few weeks and tell us what you found out. Well, one of my good friends at the hospital I work at at Cambridge University uh, is an, an anaesthetist in the intensive care department. So I'm going to go and ask Ari this weekend if he can work this out for me and if this is a, a well-known phenomenon with anaesthetics. I'm sure there's also some anaesthetists who are listening to this who can also tell us whether or not this is a known side effect of certain drugs or uh, certain procedures that are done during an operation. And so please do share your opinions. It's um, chris at thenakedscientist.com if you want to email me or you can tweet at Naked Scientist. It'd be really interesting to look into this. But yes, Africa, I promise I'll do my homework, unlike my son who won't do his homework, he never does. <laughs> and I'll come back and report back next week because it's an interesting question. It really, really is. Chris, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, the Naked Scientist joining us again next week, Friday at half past nine. And uh, you're most welcome to, throughout the week, actually, share with us your questions. And more importantly, you can go to their website, thenakedscientists.com, for more on their podcasts and the variety of subject matter that they research and report on.